Hello everyone, and welcome back to lecture three of our microbiology series. This lecture is going to cover tools that are commonly found in the microbiology lab, um, types of auger and things like that. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, the first thing to know about growing bacteria in a lab is that it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, you have to think about the fact that bacteria are found everywhere on the planet. And if we want to grow those bacteria in a lab, you have to be able to replicate those crazy environments in the lab. Um, it's kind of like a zoo. If you have a zoo animal from Africa, you need to have a nice African exhibit for them to live in, um, for them to be happy and reproduce successfully. Um, fish, you have to obviously give them a nice coral reef and things like that. Um, if you have a desert animal, same kind of thing. Um, so microbes are the same way. Um, you have to give them the environments that they need. Um, so if they grow inside of a warm-blooded animal, you have to give them a um, nice warm environment, or if they grow in the cold, or things like that. Um, so that's just a long way for me to say that it's not really easy to grow bacteria um, of some sorts in a lab. Some of them are really easy, some of them are really difficult. Um, so that's the kind of the fun in microbiology, is trying to figure out how to grow these guys. Um, but since all the environments are different, um, all the bacteria that are found in those environments have different conditions that they like. More or less moisture, um, more or less heat, more or less oxygen, more or less, um, you know, you guys get the idea, more or less nutrients and things like that. So um, that makes it very difficult to replicate some of these environments in a lab. It's kind of hard to get a, you know, minus 500 degrees um, freezer um, that can have pressure inside of it and all the stuff that some bacteria need um, to make it work. Um, well, anyway, um, so growing bacteria in the lab is not always the easiest thing to do. Not to mention, you can't see what you're working with. Um, so you don't know if they're growing, you don't know if they're uh, there until later, and you can see them on a plate. You put them down, you have to give them a couple of hours, 24 hours or so, a couple of days at the most to let them grow, um, to come back and look. So it's sometimes a little difficult to see them, um, to know that they're really there. You just kind of have to just wait them out. Um, and you can't really just pick them up and look at them and go and work. You have to put them underneath the microscope. So it's not just as easy um, as studying, say, a cow. Um, where you can put it in the backyard and you can observe it 24-7 just watching it out the window. You have to go through actual processes and things and you need tools um, to work with bacteria and microbes in a lab. So a long way to say it's sometimes you just can't do it. There are quite a few species of bacteria that we cannot grow in the lab. Um, some that we're really good at growing in the lab and then some that are some, kind of somewhere in between. Um, they grow well, but not great, um, and then the next time you try to grow them, they're not going to grow at all, um, and then they're just kind of hit or miss. It just depends on how that species is working for the day. Um, so it's not the easiest thing on the planet is just like, you know, giving an animal some food and some water, and they should be good to go for the most part. These guys are a little touchier when it comes to growing them. Well, the main tool of a microbiology lab, um, <laughs> given the fact that your specimens are invisible, is a microscope. Um, now these are the parts of a microscope. They're really, really easy. This is a compound microscope. Pretty much every single compound microscope on the planet is going to work the same. Um, they call them compound microscopes because this has magnification to it, the eyepiece is up here on the top, as well as the revolving nose piece, the oculars that are held on it. The uh, objective ones is there's usually four of them. There sometimes can be five or more, maybe three, usually four. And those objective lenses have magnification as well. So you take the magnification from the eyepiece and you compound it over the magnification with the um, objective lens. So you get double magnification. It compounds on top of each other to make the magnification bigger. So that's why they call them that. Um, so these are very commonly found in most hospitals, research labs, schools, things like that. Pretty much everybody's going to have some sort of compound light microscope. Works with a light bulb, just regular old um, LED light bulb, things like that at the bottom of it that just cast the light source up through the specimen. Um, and then we look down through it through the uh, eyepieces. Let's go through the parts of it real quick. So the eyepieces up here at the top, they usually have a magnification power of about 10 times. Um, this can be different depending on the manufacturer. Um, down you have the body tube, which kind of holds everything together. Um, then you have right here the arm, which is going to connect the base of the microscope and all the body parts down here to the top where you put your eyes in and stuff. So it's just going to hold support and uh, keep everything together. It's also where you're going to carry it. Um, attached to the body tube is the nose piece, and this thing spins around. Um, you can spin it one direction or the other um, to change the objective lens that's in focus. Um, so the objective lenses are connected to the nose piece, it spins around, the objective lenses go with it. 
um, and then they just click into place. Um, you'll hear a nice little firm click when they're uh, in the right position. Um, and then you can go from the small one, which is usually the uh, low power, or excuse me, the scanning objective, um, to the low power objective, to the high power objective, to the oil objective. Um, and you can uh, see different uh, magnification levels and things, and different detail, um, depending on how far in you want to go in your specimen. So underneath that you have the stage, which holds the slide. Um, the little slide clips here are going to hold the slide in place. Underneath that you have the diaphragm and the condenser. Um, the diaphragm works just like the shutter on a camera. The more open or closed it is, the more or less light comes through. That you uh, can make your um, what you're seeing darker or brighter. Underneath that you have the condenser. Um, and the condenser pretty much works like a magnifying glass if you've ever seen little kids burn ants. Um, it takes the sun light beam from the sun and condenses it into a tiny little fine beam um, that can then be used to burn an ant. Well, in this case, instead of burning ants, we're taking the light from the light source down here, condensing it into a little teeny tiny fine beam into the objective lens for you to see, um, to, you, to be able to illuminate our specimen on the slide. So that's how that works. Um, then you have the light source, which is the light bulb, candle, things like that, whatever's going to be emitting the source of light that illuminates the microscope. Um, over here on the side you have the course adjustment knob. This is the large one on the outside. And on the inside of that you have another little knob that one of them does this and the other one spins on the inside of that so they spin independently of another, one another, um, is the fine adjustment knob. Uh, the course adjustment knob makes the stage move up and down really quickly. The fine adjustment knob, very, very small changes. Um, and that's how you change the focus. So the course adjustment knob, you can crank it up and get it into focus real fast. And then the fine adjustment knob, you use to make very small adjustments to bring things into a really crisp, uh, sharp focus so you can get a better detail resolution on them. So it's pretty much all the parts of the microscope. They usually have a light adjustment wheel to make it darker or brighter, and the on and off switch, which is uh, usually in the front. In this case, it looks like it's right there. And those move around depending on the manufacturer of the microscope, but they're always kind of somewhere on the bottom. Um, the rest of these parts pretty much stay the same um, between manufacturers and things like that and brands and stuff. So basic generic parts of the microscope, they're pretty much all going to be the same. Um, so let's go on. A good microscope needs two things. It needs magnification and resolving power, or resolution. Um, so magnification and resolving power. If you have a good microscope, you can do both of those things at the same time. So, oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. So what does that mean? Let me go back to our microscope and get this back where we should be. Okay. Um, so what is magnification? Well, magnification is the ability to make things seem larger than they are. Um, if you have something that's quite small underneath uh, a slide, you can't see it. Um, you can use a piece of glass or something like that to make it seem larger um, than it is. So that's what magnification means. It's the, using a piece of technology or some sort of something to make the image seem larger to the naked eye than it actually is. So you're uh, like a magnifying glass or something like that. Um, so magnifying glasses uh, are something giving you something called a real image. So you're actually looking at the image itself underneath the microscope, underneath the magnifying glass. So you're looking through the magnifying glass and you actually are looking directly at what you're seeing just big. Um, a microscope, on the other hand, has two images. It's kind of like the periscope concept where you have to look through the mirror to look through the mirror to look over the hill. Um, so you're getting a light cast from one image onto the objective lens, and then the objective lens is going to the eyepiece. Kind of a little long, convoluted story. Um, but you're getting something called a virtual image because you're not actually looking at the specimen. You're looking at an image of an image of the specimen um, on, a on, a, on a microscope. So since you have that weird... Um, thing going on there, you're not actually looking at directly at your specimen, you're looking at a backwards and upside down version of it. So to learning to use a microscope is tricky for some people at the beginning because it moves in the opposite directions than you think. Um, well, anyway, um, magnifying glasses um, have a total magnification power of just the lens. You're looking at the circular piece with the handle on it, and however much magnification that has, maybe one or two powers, one or two times, that's what the magnification power of that uh, tool is. You get one times bigger than what you're looking at, two times bigger than what you're looking at, and things like that. Well, with a microscope, you have a compound microscope, as I mentioned. Um, you get the objective magnification from the little lenses that spin around, the objective lenses, and then the magnification power from the eyepieces that you actually look through. So you get two types of magnification. 
Um, and that leads us to something called total magnification. So um, if an eyepiece has 10 times magnification, like the average one does, and you're using the 10 times magnification uh, objective lens, the uh, low power lens, um, 10 times 10 is 100. So you have a total magnification of 100 times. So what you're looking at would be 100 times larger um, than if you were just using your naked eye. And that's how that works. So if you have the 10 times objective lens and you're using, uh, or eyepiece, excuse me, and you're using the 100 times objective lens, um, so 10 times 100 is 1,000. So you're looking at something 1,000 times larger um, than it actually is. So that's what total magnification is, and that's how to calculate it. And the other key, uh, one of the big key things here uh, for a microscope is resolution, not just the ability to zoom in, how far you can see, how much bigger you can make things, um, but how well you can see that thing when you zoom into it. Um, we've all done the copy a picture off the internet, post it into a Word document, try to make it bigger, and it just turns into a giant pixelated fuzzy blur and you can't see anything. Um, that's what happens when your microscope doesn't have enough resolving power. You zoom in too close, uh, too far, and your microscope can't make out what it's looking at. It's not good enough to be able to pick apart um, detail inside of what you're looking at. So everything just kind of comes across as a giant blur. Um, so technically what resolution is, it's the ability to distinguish between two different things. Um, so if you're looking at me, you would see me nice and sharp as well as the background behind me nice and sharp. Everything would be different or this mouse nice and sharp and you can distinctly tell or you could distinctly tell each one of my fingers apart from one another and that's a good resolution. If your resolution is bad, it's just going to look like a big blur, uh, kind of like a big mitten. Um, so that means the resolution is not very good. So you're not resolving each one of my fingers individually, it's just a big blur. Now how do you get res uh, resolution on a microscope? Well, resolution on a microscope can be increased by using different types of uh, light sources. Um, traditional, or uh, so I guess I should say magnification sources, I guess. Um, traditional light sor uh, magnification light microscopes use light to make their picture. Now you can see this here. This is a hand, uh, my little er uh, example earlier. And these are light beams, essentially. They're quite large. Light beams are really big. And light beams are going to bounce off the subject on your specimen, on your slide. They're going to bounce through, go up into the objective lens, and you're going to look at it that way. Well, the light beams are really big. I um, mean, you can see that here, that the light beams are sometimes too big to fit through the individual fingers. So they just can't fit through. Um, so the light beams, they can't fit through the fingers, so they fit through where they can. So they go around your fingers. So they can't get in to give you the detail that you need. So you just see a shadow of a big mitten hand. Uh, you don't get the individual fingers, the light beams are too big to fit inside, so you, they cast a shadow, they go around, and you're just left with a big dark spot in the middle that looks like a big mitten hand. So light beams are quite large. They don't give you the best resolution. Well, if you want to get that kind of detail in something, on, especially on microscopic levels on bacteria and viruses and things, you're going to need to use an electron scanning microscope. And they don't use light beams to make their picture, they use electrons. Now, an ele uh, uh, electrons are significantly smaller than light beams. <clears throat> so you can see that here. This is a light beam, and these are our individual little electrons. So the individual little electrons will be bouncing off of the surface um, of the specimen that you're trying to take a picture of, and they can get into that little detail. They can get down inside the individual fingers and get inside the little cell uh, uh, structures and things on bacteria and viruses um, and they can give you a really detailed picture um, really good resolution um, on your image and that's how microscopes come into play so if what you're looking at and what type of level of detail you need to see um, really does matter depending on what type of microscope you choose to use um, the application that it's being used for and things like that um, so you can see over here a little example using pictures, um, pixels. This is a concept of the uh, zooming in too far on a, uh, a picture that doesn't have enough pixels inside of it. Um, the smaller pixels, this is bad resolution. This would be taking pictures with our light beams, um, whereas taking pictures with our electrons, you get much more detail. Um, the greater the um, resolution, the greater the detail of the image that you see. The lower the resolution, the more blurry it's going to be. So higher resolution microscopes give better pictures. Um, so, this is an electron microscope right here. 
Um, and this is a light microscope. This is the same magnification 450 times, and you can see the difference between them. Those giant light beams, they don't give a lot of resolution. They're blurry, they're fuzzy, they can't get down to give you that great detail. They just can't fit in between all of those little nooks and crannies. Um, whereas the electrons, even at the same magnification level, they're so much smaller, they can. Um, they can get down into the nitty gritty and the little nooks and cranny of the cells and things um, to give us that great picture, the great detail that we're looking for. Um, on a microscope. So if you're using, uh, if you want that kind of detail, electron microscopes are the way to go. If you don't need it and you just need to do basic diagnostic tests or just kind of see what you're looking at, a light microscope works perfectly fine. So you can increase resolution a couple of different ways. Um, blue light has the lowest wavelength, which means it's one of the smallest, um, so it goes through a lot better um, than um, the rest of the colors. Um, using a more powerful microscope or a powerful lens that zooms in farther um, if you don't have an electron microscope, so a good way to do that. Um, you can use different types of condensers, different types of diaphragms and things. You can open them and close them at different levels, um, which can increase or decrease the amount of light that's coming through the microscope. So lots of different ways that you can increase resolution on regular microscopes other than just going to a different type of microscope altogether. So one of the other big things in a microbiology lab is the use of oil on a microscope. Um, you may have heard me mention earlier the oil objective lens. Um, now what that is, is it's the lens that's specially designed to use oil to view bacteria. Um, bacteria are very, very small. That's about the only lens on a microscope that you can see them under. You can kind of make them out a little bit underneath the other ones. Uh, but if you want to get some really good detail, you need to go underneath the oil immersion lens to see them. Now the problem is, on a microscope, when you zoom in with the oil immersion lens, let's pretend this is the slide, this is the lens that's coming down, you have to literally almost touch the slide to be able to zoom in close enough to see them to get them in focus. That's how close you'll be to that slide. You're almost going to be touching it. And when you get that close to something, light is going to have a bit of a difficulty transmitting uh, through it. If you've ever looked at a flashlight, um, you know the closer you are to a flashlight, the brighter it is. Well, eventually what happens is you get so close that it's going to just be one solid beam. And if you put anything in front of that, it's going to disperse that light. And that's what our slide does. Um, it disperses the light. Now, when you're farther away, you can get a lot of the light coming through it. But when you're closer to it, um, the light's going to hit the slide and it's going to instantaneously kind of do this. So this is the slide that you can see this here. The light's going to come up. It's going to hit the slide and it's going to instantaneously just kind of spurt off to the side. The lens, the glass is going to deflect the light and send it off to the side. Um, farther up, not a huge deal. Um, the rest of the lenses don't really matter. You've got enough light coming through. Um, outside light that can bend back or uh, that can be collect, recollected um, all the rest of the way through. But when you get really close, you don't have enough light coming through um, from, that's lost to the side as well. So the stuff that goes through and the stuff that's lost to the side, you need both of those to be able to see well. So how do you fix this problem? You add a small little layer of oil on the slide itself. And when you add that little layer of oil on the slide, it bends the light beam back in. So the light beam comes up, hits the slide, it's deflected, um, and then it hits the oil instead of the environment or the air, and it just bends through the oil and goes right back into the slide. So adding oil increases the resolution power because the more light's going through, um, and it also increases our ability to uh, see things better, so the resolution is increased just by adding oil. So these are a couple of different fields of uh, microscopy, different, or sorry, different types, I should say, of microscopy. Um, if you want to look at living cells or dead cells or moving cells or the internal structures of cells and things like that, you're going to need different types of microscopes. Um, and there's different applications that are used to prepare the specimens ahead of time um, or during the microscope uh, microscopy viewing process. So these are the types of micros microscopy, um, the field of using a microscope microscopy that are commonly found out there. Um, so if you were to walk into a lab, pretty much in any hospital, any research lab on the planet, any school, this is the most commonly used type of microscopy on the planet, a bright field microscope. Um, this is the uh, regular old, put a slide on a compound microscope, turn it on, and you're looking at bright field microscopy, a bright field microscope. Um, this is the lights coming underneath, it illuminates the specimen, the shadow from the specimen is what you're looking at. You're looking at the specimen um, slide, 
um, with the light cast underneath it. And this works really well to see things that are alive. You can watch them move around, swim around on the stage and things like that. Um, and it also works really well for stained specimens. Um, so if you add a, a type of dye to these to make them blue or green or yellow, um, they're going to stand out against that nice, bright, uh, illuminated background. Um, and that's what you're looking for. So these guys are going to be darker because they don't they cast a shadow. Um, so you're going to see the darker living organisms stand out underneath the um, against that bright illuminated background of a microscope. So this is the traditional microscopes. You can see that here, that bright white background, all that light from the microscope. Um, and then you can see the little cells um, on top of it blocking out the light. Um, and then we can make out a little bit of the detail inside of the cell. So this is traditional bright field microscopy. Oh, I did it again. Okay. And on the other side of that, instead of bright field microscopy, we have dark field microscopy. Um, dark field microscopy is used the other way around. Um, you darken the background and the bacteria stand out against that. Um, there are some bacteria that don't take stain well. Um, and some, if you stain them, they die. So if you want to look at these types of organisms while they're alive, um, you have to put them against a dark background for them to be able to be seen. And now, if you were to just take traditional bacteria, stick it on a slide and some water and put it under the microscope, they're clear. You can't really see them very well, no detail. So stains are traditionally added to them to see them, and that's what makes them stand out against that bright background. Um, now, like I said, some bacteria will die if you add stain to them. Some of them just won't stain. Um, so if you want to look at these bacteria, you have to darken the background and let them stand out against it because they just won't take the stain um, or they will die. So if you want to look at those types of organisms moving around and things like that, you darken the background and you shine the light through these uh, clear bacteria organisms or whatever you're looking at themselves, and then you can watch them move around against that dark background. So this is a Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, this is a common bacteria that's used for dark field microscopy. You have phase contrast microscopy. And this is kind of cool. Um, you use different wavelengths of light. Um, so you put your specimen on the, sl the slide, um, on your microscope, and then you change the wavelengths of light that are being used to view um, the structure um, specimen as well as the intensity of the light that's going through it. So sometimes uh, um, you probably have seen, um, if you've ever gone to like a black light course or something like that, or a laser tag, where your shirts reflect different colors underneath those black lights. Um, the same thing kind of happens to things in nature and organisms and bacteria. Different wavelengths of light uh, make them reflect better or, or gives a better picture of different structures and things like that than others. Um, so when you run a gambit, um, of wavelengths through that particular specimen, you're more likely to get a wavelength or something of light or intensity of light that allows you to resolve that particular structure, whereas it might not have resolved in a different, uh, different wavelength or something like that. So you get a really good picture because you've run through all the different intensities, all the different wavelengths, so everything that could be resolved has been resolved. Um, so phase contrast microscopy gives you a really good picture because it allows you to change and make sure that everything's being resolved as best as it possibly can. Um, fluorescence microscopy. Now this is super cool. Um, you stain bacteria um, or the insides of bacteria with particular types of dyes that are fluorescent underneath UV light. Um, so you need a microscope that has been modified to uh, pr uh, produce UV light instead of traditional, just regular light, and a filter that allows you to look through it without the UV light nuking your eyeballs. Um, so if you've got that, you're good to go. So what you do is you can take a, uh, a tissue sample from someone that you suspect has a particular disease, um, and you can stain that tissue with a, a particular type of dye that will bind to the bacteria and you stick it underneath that microscope, turn it on, and if the bacteria are there, they're going to fluoresce like crazy. Um, and that's the only thing that's going to fluoresce. So they just shine out like crazy. I um, mean, you can see them here. 
Um, so the bacteria are the only things that are fluorescing. You can use this type of microscopy for really cool things. Um, you can use this to do gene uh, sequencing to see if they have, a, or not gene sequencing, sampling to see if they have a particular gene that expresses a particular protein that the dyes can bind to. It's super neat. Um, so really cool fluorescence microscopy. Um, you have scanning confocal microscopy. Um, and this uses a laser beam instead of a light beam to take our pictures. Um, laser beams are much smaller than light beams. They're also much more high energy, which means they can go through on the surface. A light beam might go down about that far into a specimen. Laser beams can go through farther. They're higher energy. Um, so you get a much better picture on um, depth of field. You can view through the specimen, different levels of the specimen that you're looking through. And you can see that here um, as we burrow through the specimen a little bit. Um, with the laser beam. So super cool uh, scanning confocal microscopy. And then you've got electron microscopy, possibly the neatest one. Um, it uses those electrons again instead of light beams, so much smaller um, than light beams. So you get a way better resolution, higher magnification, um, anywhere up to about a million times. You can literally see the surface of viruses and the surface of all kinds of crazy things. It's pretty neat. Um, and you can see that down here. This is a little diatom. Um, small little uh, aquatic organisms that pretty much made a little made of chalk and glass and things. Really cool little organisms. Um, now there's two different types of uh, electron microscopes. You have a scanning electron microscope and a transmission, a transmit, transmission or transmitting electron microscope. Um, scanning electron microscopes are super cool. Take a little specimen, you coat it in metal, the electrons bounce off the metal, um, and that's what you get when you're looking at the picture. And this is a scanning right here. And then you've got a transmission, which gives you a much cooler, sorry, the, the scanning right here, this is our uh, transmission right here, a flat surface. So scanning gives you three-dimensional, which is super neat. Um, and then our transmission just gives you a really detailed um, image, but it's not three-dimensional. So that's the difference between the two. Much cooler, in my opinion, on our scanning. So as I mentioned earlier, bacteria are pretty much going to be clear underneath a microscope. So we've already gone over what the different types of microscopes are, what the different uses of them are, different types of microscopy and things like that. Um, so let's talk about bacteria if you want to look at it underneath one of those microscopes. So let's pretend right now that we're going to be using just bright field traditional microscopy um, using our compound scope, just regular old scope. Um, so there are two main ways that you're going to stain bacteria for that. If you just take a regular old living bacteria off of a slide, uh, off of your sample, stick it on a slide, put it underneath your scope, you're going to have a really hard time finding it. They're pretty much invisible. Um, so you need to stain them uh, to start with. So there's two types of preparations that you can do before you get to stain something. Um, so if you want to look at something, you've got to do one of these two things to it. You have to prepare it in some way. Um, if you want to look at living cells, you probably don't want to stain them too much. Um, you might add a little bit of stain so they stand out too much, but if you do too much stain, you might kill them. Um, but that type of preparation is called a wet mount. You're going to take living bacteria or a living protist sample or a living algae or something like that, put it on a slide, and let those organisms live and do their thing on that slide while you observe them. Um, it will allow you to watch them move around, to watch them eat, um, see what they do, see if and how they move. Um, you can see the main four things of microbiology, the size, shape, and arrangement. Or size, the main three things, um, size, shape, and arrangement, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, you can also see if they can, like I mentioned, if they're modal or not, they can move. And that's super useful for living cells. Um, now, the other type of mount that you preparation that you can do is something called a fixed mount. And this is made for using um, dead cells when you want to stain them. Um, and this is what we're going to do for most bacteria cells. We don't want to use living bacteria on a microscope. Um, they have the potential to make you sick um, or contaminate the environment, contaminate other specimens, contaminate other humans, other people, animals, the environment, whatever. Um, so we don't want living bacteria just floating around the lab willy-nilly. Um, so we're going to kill them and dry them on our slide using a fixed mount method. Um, and that allows us to look at dead cells underneath the microscope. They're not going to move around. Um, they're not going to be living anymore. But we can still see the size, shape, and arrangement, what they look like, 
what shape they are, how big they are, and what they're, uh, how they're put together in the groove, if they are at all, um, underneath a fixed mount. So fixed mounts are going to be used for dead cells. Um, wet mounts are going to be used for living cells. You can use them for dead cells um, if you just want to put some dead cells in there, but they're most traditionally going to be used for living, uh, living organisms. So wet mounts for living things, fixed mounts for dead things. Good way to go with that. So um, let's pretend that we're going to stick with fixed mounts. And how do we do a fixed mount? What's the point of this? Why are we doing this? And things like that. Well, um, as I mentioned, bacteria are alive. Um, you find them off the plate, you find them from your specimen, your sample, your patient, things like that. Um, and they're going to be living. If you take that living like bacteria, put it on a slide, uh, stick it underneath your microscope, the slide's got a living bacteria on it. Now the microscope, again, it touches the slide. If it touches them, it has bacteria on it. Now your hands might get bacteria on them. Um, unless you remember to clean everything, it's a big hassle. You could contaminate everything, make people sick, make yourself sick, um, contaminate your entire lab with the wrong species, um, and that could have all kinds of negative consequences. So um, fixed mounts are designed to just kill the bacteria to get rid of that overall. Um, but it also has the nice little added bonus side effect of gluing them to the slide. Um, so if you're looking at something living, it's going to be moving around, you don't want it stuck in place. Um, but if you're going to try to add some stain to something, um, imagine kind of throwing some, I don't know, throw, throw a pasta noodle at some glass, uh, at the glass, maybe a window. And you let it sit there, and you wait for two or three minutes, and you walk up to it, and you start spraying it with Windex. It's going to instantaneously wash off that window. It's not going to stick there, it's going to wash away, um, and it'll go away. But if you let that pasta noodle dry and stick to that window, you can spray as much Windex as you want to, and without some scrubbing, it's not going to fall off because it's stuck to that glass. And that's the same concept here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take these living bacteria that are floating around in a little drop of water. So you take your slide, you put a small little drop of water on it, and you collect a bunch of bacteria and you smear them in that little drop of water. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to hold that little drop of water over a heat source, either an open flame or an incinerator or something, to dry out the water and the bacteria that you've spread around inside of it. So what's going to happen is the water dries out. The little bacteria, they have a sugary coating on the outside of them, um, and that little sugary coating starts to melt. Um, if you've ever melted sugar, it gets super sticky. Um, and that's the same thing that's going to pretty much happen to them. The outside of their cells get super sticky, and they stick to that glass slide. As the you remove the heat source, you don't want to go too long, you'll crack the slide. You can burn the bacteria as well. Um, you've killed them. They've been killed because of the heat. You've melted their sugary outside coatings. They stick to the slide, and you take them off of the heat source, um, they are removed from the heat source and now they're permanently stuck to that glass slide as the sugar cools and they stay stuck to that um, glass slide. You don't have to worry about when you add your liquid to it, they're going to wash away. They're going to be permanently affixed to that slide unless you scrub them off. Um, so heat fixing is this type of process, it's what this is known as, and it has two functions. Um, one is to kill the bacteria. You don't want living bacteria floating around in the lab on your microscope. And the other one is to just stick them permanently to the slide um, so you can add stain to them so they don't wash away. Um, if you added liquid to a living bacteria, stain to a living bacteria, it would just wash it away. Um, and then that would be kind of pointless. So that's what the point of heat fixing is. Um, now, I should probably mention, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to mention that here. Um, there are two main types of stains. There's a, a fix of a fix mount stains anyway. There are positive type stains and negative type stains. Now what does that look like? I'm just going to talk about it here instead of in word form, but this is what this looks like. This is a positive type stain right here, and this is a negative type stain right here. So a positive type stain um, is going to be used to visualize the bacteria on the inside. So what you can see here, this is traditional bright field. Um, we have our bright background that illuminates a stained cell on the inside. So you can see that here. Um, the little circles are the bacteria themselves, and you can see them standing out as little purple circles against that bright background. So in a positive type stain, the bacteria themselves are going to uptake the dye, uptake the stain, 
and the inside of the bacteria is what you're going to be looking at, the stained bacteria themselves. So that's a positive type fixed mount stain. Our other common type is a negative type. And you can see that here. Now this is common bright field again, but instead of dyeing the uh, bacteria specimens themselves, we've dyed the background. Now this might seem like dark field microscopy, but it's not. Um, this is traditional bright field microscopy. We're not darkening the light source itself. We're just darkening the slide. So this is different than that, and that's a little bit why. Um, a little couple more details in there, but this is not dark field microscopy. Um, this is traditional bright field. Um, but you can see the background is slightly more illuminated. It's not black. Um, and you can see the little bacteria standing out against it. Now they've been heat fixed as well for the most part. They're going to be stuck to it. And you can see them floating around in our negative type stain here. Um, they light up the back against that background. So there's another type of stain. Um, these are going to be our positive type stains. So we're not going to focus on the negative type stains right now. We're going to focus on our positive type stains. Um, and this is one of the most common types of positive stains. It's called simple stain. And they call it a simple stain because it's uh, using one dye. You heat fix your bacteria to the slides, you add one dye source to them, usually methylene blue or, or crystal violet or something like that. Um, that dye will penetrate the cell, um, usually binds by electrical charge to the DNA or the cell wall or something inside of that or on that bacteria. Um, you wait 30 seconds or so to let it do its thing, and then you wash off all the excess stain. Um, and what you're left with is this down here in the corner, where the bacteria themselves, um, which were glued to the slide, sucked up a bunch of that dye. And now they are illuminated as blue from the inside, um, and the background just stays white. You wash all that away. Now, a simple stain doesn't really tell you very much use about the bacteria themselves. Um, it's going to give you a little bit of detail in the sense of the size, shape, and arrangement of how these things are put together, and we'll talk about what that means later. Um, the shape overall, just what they're uh, caucus-shaped or rod-shaped or spiral. Um, the arrangement, what uh, forms they're put together in, and the size is uh, relative, small, and large, and things like that. Um, so this was what a simple stain is going to tell you, those three things. It doesn't tell you anything useful diagnostically speaking. This is not a gram stain. This is not a differential or a diagnostic stain. All it does is allow you to see what type of bacteria you're looking at in the sense of size and shape and arrangement. Um, so it's useful. It narrows it down from, say, a minivan to a truck, but it doesn't narrow it down any more than just truck. Um, so instead of saying automobiles, you now just have a truck, and that's a little more useful than automobiles, but not a lot. Um, so simple stains are, are useful, but they're not the most useful things on the planet, um, and they're not useful for medical purposes. Now on the other hand, differential stains are. Um, they allow for a little more diagnostic purposes. Um, and this can allow you to tell apart a Nissan truck from a Ford truck instead of just a generic truck. So you get a little more information. Um, so these are pretty cool. This is a combination of dyes using more than one dye at a time. Um, that's going to bond differently to different types of bacteria. So dye one will bond to uh, more bacteria that have a lot more peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Dye two, um, bacteria that doesn't have peptidoglycan in their cell walls are not going to be infected by it or, or impacted by it or less peptidoglycan. Um, more sugar on the outside, less sugar, more waxy, less waxy. All these different things, different types of stains will bond differently um, to different bacteria. Now, the combination of dyes that you use them in allow you to differentiate out different types of bacteria. So it'll allow you to say, oh, this species and this species are here, or this species is not here, but this one is. Um, so it allows you to get a little more information. What it also gives you is the size, shape, and arrangement, as well as some extra information. So this is a simple stain plus. So you get the stain part, you get the size, shape, and arrangement. You can see these are little rods, look kind of like little hot dogs. Um, and then you get that extra little plus of, oh, this is a little bit about the bacteria itself, how their cells are put together. Do they have a lot of peptidoglycan in their cell walls? Um, and things like that. So differential stains allow for a little more information um, if you do it correctly. Um, so the most common types of differential stains out there are gram stains and acid fast stains. So a gram stain is probably the most common type of stain that's used in microbiology. Um, it's so common 
that there are machines that hospitals that do this for us. Um, all the human has to do is put the specimen on the slide, click it into the little machine, and then the machine does the rest of the process. This is so common. Um, now what this does is it breaks bacteria up into the two main categories of bacteria. If you are a bacteria, for the most part, almost all of them are going to fall. I think all of them do, even if they're not technically considered one. Um, they're going to fall into the category of gram-positive or gram-negative. This is going to be um, the cat or dog, if you like. You are one or the other. There is no in-between. And this has to do with how the bacteria stain, um, how they're put together technically from a cell uh, perspective, how their cells are put together, is what makes these two differences up. Gram-positive bacteria tend to be more common in the environment. They tend to be a little more hardy to desiccation, drying out, um, and things like that. Gram-negatives tend to be found a little more inside living organisms. Um, they like more moist and warm environments and things like that. So gram-negatives tend to be a little more um, disease-causing organisms. Gram-positives will have quite a few of them do cause disease. Um, they tend to be a little more environmentally friendly, a little more environmentally skewed, whereas gram-negatives tend to be a little more um, organism skewed. Now, what this matters is uh, when this comes into play is when it comes to diagnosing um, antibiotics. Gram-positive antibiotics that kill them don't um, uh, commonly work on gram-negatives. Um, and the antibiotics that kill gram-negatives don't commonly work on the gram-positives. And that has to do with the structural differences between the two types of cells, how they're put together, what makes one a dog and what makes one a cat, if you like, how they're put together. Um, so your doctor, the very first thing they're going to do or the uh, med tech or whoever is doing this. Um, you come into the hospital and you have a horrible infection. Um, you pr are close to death. They're going to take a very quick bacterial sample, streak it out, see if it's gram positive or gram negative, and they're going to start you on a broad spectrum antibiotic that kills one of those. If you're gram positive, they're going to hang you up on a gram positive um, um, broad spectrum antibiotic. It might not kill the gram positive that you have, but at least it's going to kill most gram positives. And we know that it's probably going to kill the one you've got um, hopefully. But if you just randomly started an antibiotic, it could be a gram-negative. Um, and then that antibiotic that you're doing is not going to do anything. So these types of stains are the very first step um, in diagnosing someone. It allows you to get an early, oh, well, it's not the gram-negative. Let's just hang up a broad-spectrum antibiotic that'll hopefully uh, treat the infection while we're diagnosing it down to the actual species it is to figure out what individual antibiotic we should use. Um, so that's really where that comes into play is when you're treating um, with antibiotics. So this is the gram staining process. It's a very interesting process. It has to do with the cell walls um, of the bacteria themselves. Um, so this is the process. Um, we'll go over gram staining in the lab um, and how this works on a detailed level. So acid fast staining. Now acid fast staining, um, once again, we'll go over this in lab on a more detailed level. Um, it's used to identify species commonly in the bacteria genus Mycobacterium, uh, Mycobacterium leprae, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, they cause leprosy, tuberculosis. There's Mycobacterium avum, which causes Mycobacterium aves complex. Um, it's a respiratory disease commonly found in late stage immunocompromised patients. It's found in the dirt. Um, so. Um, this particular species of bacteria, while it's technically gram-positive, if you could stain it, they don't stain. Um, it has a gram-positive cell wall. Um, it has the exact same structure that we'll talk about later on of what that is. Um, on paper, it is a gram-positive bacteria. But these guys, this particular genus, as you can kind of see here, they look really waxy. Their, their cell walls are very waxy, and the reason for that is these guys produce this very interesting thing inside of them called mycolic acid. Um, and it's bound inside of their cell walls and their cell membranes. Um, so you can't d stick dye to this. If you've ever poured uh, water on a candle wax or something like that, it just runs off. It doesn't stick to it. And that's the same thing that happens to these guys. They have that waxy coating um, that prevents water from sticking to it or dyes and stains from sticking to it. And they have this because it keeps them from drying out in the environment. Um, it, keeps, it allows them to be able to survive on the tabletop or on a, a surface for months on end without being able to dry out and die from uh, 
lack of moisture. Um, so that's what the purpose of this mycolic acid is. It keeps them uh, from drying out in the environment. Um, so if you want to look at these guys underneath the microscope, you have to stain them with something that's going to stick to mycolic acid. And in this case, um, carbol fusion is the dye that does that. It only sticks to mycolic acid, um, so we know that. So we use that to view these types of bacteria. So you can see that over here, all these little red ones, these little red dots are mycobacterium um, species. And we stain the background with a different type of dye. Um, so you can see the rest of the bacteria are human cells, whatever you happen to be looking at, in with the red bacteria standing out against the normal uh, healthy cells or uh, normal bacteria that aren't acid fast in the samples. Um, so if it sticks to them, it sticks to that mycolic acid only to mycolic acid. If you're a regular bacteria, it's not going to stick to you. Um, so that's what acid fast is useful for, uh, diagnosing these special types of bacteria. Well, there's a couple of different types of other stains, other than our just traditional positive and negative stain. Um, there are structural stains. And this is what you want to use if you want to see the insides or outsides of the bacteria. Uh, maybe stuff on the insides of it you want to view it in greater detail, or maybe you want to see if there's something on the outside of that bacteria cell and things like that. Um, so one of the most common types of structural stain is something called a capsule stain. Now a capsule um, is essentially a little protective sugar uh, cube that bacteria wear around them. So I would be the bacteria, you have this giant capsule around you, um, and that prevents or protects um, the bacteria from being eaten and phagocytized by the immune system. So if the immune system gets a hold of it, um, it either won't be able to phagocytize it, it can't bring it in, or if it does, it'll just pass right through, and that bacteria will be unharmed instead of digested by the immune cell. So capsules are really useful uh, for a bacteria, but also very dangerous for us, because if you have a bacteria that's causing a disease that has a capsule on it, um, it's way more infectious and harder to, to treat than bacteria that of the same genus that don't have the capsule. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, comes in capsulated and unencapsulated form. It causes uh, pneumococcal pneumonia. It kills a lot of elderly people. Um, the unencapsulated form does not cause disease, whereas the capsulated form does. Um, so that's the, kind of what that does in there. It allows them to uh, be way more um, efficient at causing disease. So if you want to see if bacteria have capsules, um, you have to stain the background to be able to see if they have that capsule. Um, so you're going to stain the background. The stain itself will uh, not be able to penetrate that capsule. And what you'll see is the bacteria in the middle that uptook the dye and a big giant blank space representing their capsule around it that the dye was unable to penetrate and then the dye in the background. So the background is stained, the bacteria themselves are stained, and then that little space in between represents the capsule um, that the stain is unable to penetrate. So you just get a nice little clear spot um, where that capsule is. Um, so this is how you visualize a capsule. Um, these are most commonly found in gram-negative rod bacteria. Um, there are other species that have them. Um, and once again, very, very useful for diagnostic purposes um, to see if you have the uncapsulated or the capsulated strain that's causing a particular disease or not. Bacteria produce endospores, um, as we talked about in our very first lecture, the little heat-resistant form of the bacteria that allows it to survive pretty much the uh, apocalypse. And if you want to visualize if a bacteria produces those spores or not, you have to be able to get the stain inside of those spores. Now, if you recall, those spores are very, very heat resistant. They're very tough. They have a very thick uh, coating around them. So you have to use heat to force uh, the dye inside. You essentially are going to put a sample on a slide and add that sample, heat fix it, add it over some boiling water to allow some steam to heat up the bacteria, which causes the endospore cell walls to open up kind of a little bit. The heat forces the stain inside via the steam. Um, the pressure of the water moving around and steam pressure and things like that forces the dye inside. You take the heat source away. Um, the bacteria cool down. Their cell walls shrink back up, trapping the dye inside of them. Or the endospores, I should say. And then you add a counter stain um, to see the bacteria to it. In this case, it's saffron in the little kind of blood red color. So what you see here are these green endospores that uptook that dye forced in by the heat. Um, it killed everything. Everything's dead here. Uh, but these green endospores 
uh, took that heat, uh, the dye by the heat. If you just poured uh, dye on an endospore regularly, a bacteria that produces endospores, the endospores will not uptake the dye. You won't be able to see them. And so you have to be able to force that dye inside of them with the heat, and that's how you do that. Um, so these green endospores stand out now. Um, they're not just clear little structures that we can't see. We force the dye inside. And then the bacteria that produce those endospores, um, the rods are illuminated by the counter stain on the, uh, the, the purple as well on that slide. So you can see the green endospores um, and then this, the purple uh, or the kind of reddish uh, bacteria uh, around them. So if you find those endospores, you know your specimen produces them. Um, and if you don't find those endospores, you know that it does not produce endospores. Um, now there are only uh, going to be endospores produced in members that are gram-positive rods. Um, those are the only types of bacteria that produce endospores, and that's it. There are no others that produce that. Um, and a couple of the main spore formers are going to be Clostridium, causes botulism, um, things like that. There are a bunch of Clostridium species. Bacillus causes a lot of intestinal gastro problems and things like that. Um, and those are two of the main species of gram-positive rods that produce endospores that you're likely to come in contact with in a clinical setting. Okay, um, a flagella stain. Bacteria have flagella and it helps them move around. It's the little tails uh, that they spin around um, to move around in the environment. And sometimes you want to see those. So you want to see if they have one or two or a bunch um, where they're at on the bacteria. And that's very useful for diagnosing. Um, if you, you want to make sure that the bacteria is what it says it is and it looks the way that it's supposed to be and things like that. Um, so you want to make sure that the flagella are where they're supposed to be, the right amount and things like that. Um, so you have to use a specialized type of dye that will stick to the flagella and only the flagella um, to allow you to see them. Otherwise, they're too small um, and you can't really see them underneath a microscope, a light microscope. This type of dye binds to the flagella in a really, really, really thick uh, coating. It makes the flagella that's previously invisible really, it goes from like that to like this. It makes it really thick, really heavy. Um, so you could uh, now visualize that underneath a light microscope, whereas you couldn't uh, previously. So flagella stains are pretty neat. Okay, so if you're going into a microbiology lab, and someone sits down in front of you and now you know how to use a microscope, you know what the microscopes do, and you now know what the types of stains are and a little bit about how the types of stains are used. How do we figure out what a bacteria is using this type of information? Um, well, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the six eyes of microbiology. Isol inoculation, isolation, incubation, inspection, information gathering, and identification. Um, so these are the steps that you take to identify a brand new species or whatever's causing an infection. So you got a patient, they come in, um, you take a sample from them, and that's the start. And that's what you're going to do all the way up into the identification point where you can give your patient um, a diagnosis and a treatment. So isolation. The very first thing that you need to do when you get a sample um, or you're taking a sample from a patient is to get an isolated colony from that or an isolated species from that sample. Um, now, when you take a sample from the environment, pretty much anywhere, you are never, ever, ever going to find bacteria growing by itself on a plate uh, or on a, on a sample. Now, that's what I mean to say is you won't find just one species. You're not going to find just Staphylococcus aureus that's causing someone's disease in their staph infection uh, wound on their hand. You're just not going to find it. You, know, you will find it, but you'll also find lots and lots and lots of other bacteria there as well. Now, your job as a microbiologist is to identify which one of those five, six hundred, maybe 15, 20, 30 species that you identified um, is going to be the one that's causing the disease. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's where isolation comes into play. You're going to have to get all of those species separated apart from one another. You're going to have to get all 15 species growing together in one big blob on a plate and separate them out from one another where you can get individual species growing on a plate that you can work with. Um, if you try to do tests with multiple species on a plate, maybe this one uh, gives you a positive result for this test and this different species gives you a negative result. Um, so you're never going to get uh, uh, consistent results. Your results will be different if you use multiple species at the same time, it's called a mixed culture. Um, you end up with conflicting results, different uh, different results and things like that. So you want to use 
one singular species of bacteria to work with um, because it's predictable. Every single time that you test it, it should come back gram positive, gram positive, gram positive. Every single time it should do the exact same thing on the test that it does every single time. And that's how you know you've got the same species. So the first way to get that is to isolate away one species from all the rest of them that you've identified in your patient. So you take a sample from their throat, put it on a petri dish, and you grow that up. You've got 20, 15, maybe so different species growing on your plate, and you take a little tiny colony as an isolated colony that's just sitting off by itself, not touching anybody else, and you're going to pick that little colony off the plate. You want it not touching anybody else because that's probably going to be um, one species. It's not touching anyone, so the chances of it having multiple species in it are pretty small. And you're going to take that little colony and you're going to move it over to a brand new petri dish and you're going to spread it around and start a brand new petri dish, hopefully with just one species on it. Um, now, what we're looking for are things called isolated colonies. Um, we want to get bacteria that aren't growing in a big blob on top of one another, you know, four or five species spread around. Um, we want to get them spread out where they're not touching anybody, where you've got a little colony here, colony here, colony there, colony here, and not just a big solid line. Um, and that's what we're looking for is those little isolated colonies. And the reason we want these little isolated colonies um, is because if they're not touching anyone else, that means that they're probably going to be their own species. Um, as you move bacteria around on your petri dish, you're going to spread them around from the loop. So you're going to start up here, you're going to have a lot, and the farther you go down the petri dish, you're going to have less and less bacteria as you go. As you spread them around, the chances of breaking up individual little bacteria cells along the way increases. And hopefully what you'll get are maybe one or two of the same species of bacteria over here by themselves, way far away from everybody else, and they'll grow and divide and make a little colony um, of all genetically identical bacteria in one spot. Um, and then you can take that one little colony, scoop it off of there, and then you've got all the same genetically identical species um, to work with. And you can make a new pure culture colony to do real tests with and figure out what's causing your patient's sickness and prescribe antibiotics accordingly. Um, so isolation is a very key thing. You need to get away um, species that are causing disease, um, separate them out, um, from other bacteria that aren't causing disease and things like that so you can figure out which one is causing disease, which one isn't, um, and how to pr properly prescribe uh, treatment. So there are tons of different ways to isolate bacteria. Um, the very most common one is something called a streak plate, a streak for isolation. Now you can kind of see what I'm talking about up here. Um, this is a very heavy field of bacteria. You can clearly see here that there are one, two, three different species in this particular culture. You have a yellow one, a red one, and kind of a kind of milky colored one. Um, over here you can't see that. It's just a big giant blob. If you were to take a sample from right there and try to use this to make a test, you're going to get three different results from three different species. And you cannot diagnose somebody like that because it's not consistent. Um, so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to spread them out on a plate in a very controlled, very specific manner to increase the chances that you'll break them up and they're not just going to be blobbed together anymore. And you can see that's been accomplished over here. Um, very uh, methodical, you can see it over here. Um, streaking technique, you hold the plates in the correct way, you move the loop around in the correct way and things like that to spread around um, the bacteria. And what you end up with, as you can see that here, is one little yellow colony all by himself, one little red colony all by himself, and then one little milky colony all by himself. All these yellow guys, you can clearly see they're not touching anyone else, are probably going to be genetically identical, the exact same species, very useful for diagnostic purposes, and you can start a brand new plate with that. Same for this red guy, and same for this clear guy. They're all isolated apart. You can scoop them up, you can get in there and get them out with a loop. You don't have to worry about touching or contaminating with any of the other species. Your results will be consistent across your test, and you can diagnose what that particular species of bacteria is whereas you can't do that up here. Another way to do that um, is with something called a pour plate. You essentially just add bacteria to a petri dish that contains, or to a um, test tube that contains some auger. You spread it around, and then you pour that auger into a petri dish and let it cool. Um, you spread it around, you shook it up, and that took the bacteria from being on the loop and spread them all through the auger, and then you pour them out, and they, when you pour them out in the petri dish, um, they naturally just spread out and isolate, 
And then as the auger cools, they start to grow. Um, and then you can go in there and scoop them out isolated this way. So it's a little um, more complicated version of this. And then you can do a spread plate technique. And this is the hockey stick technique. You put a little drop of your sample in the middle um, and you spread it around on the plate with a tiny little glass hockey stick. You just smear it around. And then as you can see here, they spread out as well. You can get a little nice red isolate here, a bunch of nice little beautiful yellow isolates that are all separated out, and a clear one over here in the corner. Um, so lots of different ways to do this. In fact, there are more than just these three. Um, but isolation is one of the most important aspects for diagnosing um, and working in microbiology, being able to get one species away from all of the background noise. Well, once you've gotten your bacteria away, um, you want to inspect it to make sure that it's not contaminated. Um, you want to make sure that you have just one species growing. Now, the easiest way to do that is to just look at it. Um, if you can see that every single thing on there is the same color, all these colonies are yellow, yellow, oh, wait a minute, that one's not, and that one's not, and this, these couple aren't, uh-oh, my plate is supposed to be all yellow, but I've, it looks like I've got a couple of extra bacteria colors in there. So this means that this is not a pure culture. You've got a mixed culture still. You can see over here that this bacteria looks like a beautiful petri dish. It looks like they did a really good streak for isolation. They've only got red except for this big blob here. Now this looks like contamination, maybe from the environment. Maybe something fell into the petri dish from the ecosystem or maybe um, it fell off their shirt or something like that. This looks like they didn't get a very good isolate to start with. It looks like the culture they had was contaminated to start with, a mixed culture to begin with. This one just looks like contamination from the environment. And then you can see here really pretty pure cultures. Every single cell inside of here, every single little colony, it's the same kind of little small circles. They're all the same kind of milky. All of these guys are all the same kind of weird yellow. And all of these are the same kind of weird red. And that's really how you tell these apart. Yeah, just kind of give them a once good visual look over to make sure that they are all it's the same color, all the size, same shape, all the same size, all the colonies look the same. If they are the same, uh, you're good to go. You have your pure culture. If they're different, they don't look the same, you might still have a mixed culture. Um, probably best to just start over so you don't um, accidentally misdiagnose someone. So then you move on to identification. Um, and there are lots and lots and lots of different ways to identify bacteria. Um, you can identify them based on what they look like and how they stain. Um, some bacteria are really easy to do that with, some of them aren't. Um, you can put them on bacterial auger media, which we'll talk about shortly, and see what they do on that auger. You can give them a DNA sequence. You can send them off to a lab and let the lab tell you what species of bacteria you have. Um, and then you can do immuno immunological tests. I mean, you can see that here. This is a PPD, purified protein derivative type test. Um, looking for um, presence or absence of tuberculosis. Um, so you can use the body's immune system to see if they've ever, uh, if the patient's ever come in contact with a particular bacteria or not, um, and if they have antibodies present in their blood or not for that particular species. Um, and that's how you can identify it. Um, instead of actually working with the bacteria itself, you can use the patient's body to tell you, a uh, patient's immune system. So lots and lots and lots of different ways to do this. Um, but one of the main common ways and one of the main tools that we'll use a lot in a microbiology lab is media. Microbiology media. And media in microbiology is just kind of one of these catch-all terms um, that refers to the food that bacteria eats and how we give it to them. The delivery vehicle for their food is essentially the best way to put that. <laughs> how we get the food to the bacteria is referred to as media. Um, there are three things that we really need to be concerned about with media. Um, how we choose what type of media to use and things like that. These three things need to come into play. The physical state of the media. Um, is it a solid media? Um, and solid usually refers to jello consistency. Um, is it a liquid like soup? Is it runny? Is it a semi-solid? Does it kind of move around very slowly? Um, is it going to be synthetic or chemically defined or complex? We'll talk about what that means shortly. Um, and then what's it used for, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. So all of these things need to be taken into account when you choose a media to work with in microbiology. So physical state. Um, these are the three main forms of auger that you'll find out there. You will find liquid. 
And this is literally what it sounds like. Um, it's a broth, uh, usually vegetable-based broth or animal-based broth that will never solidify. It stays liquid for um, from the point it's made um, until you, you get rid of it. Um, it will never turn into a solid ever. Very useful to see bacteria that move around. Um, very useful to test for oxygen affiliation, which we'll get into later in this course. Um, also, really just a very commonly used way to quickly grow bacteria. Um, you have semi-solid bacteria, and this is kind of like half jello. Um, so you've probably seen jello before when it's not completely set up before, and you can kind of it's kind of chunky and just kind of sloshes around a little bit. This is what that stuff is. Um, it will move around a little bit, but it's not super solid and it's not super runny. Um, and this allows you to test to see if bacteria move around um, or not. Over here, the water can move them around, you can slosh them around, but over here this is pretty solid but kind of runny. And if bacteria can move or not, you can see that. These guys can't move, they stuck where you there are where you put them. These guys moved a little bit, they spread out throughout the auger, and this one moved a lot, the whole thing went red. So you stick a little needle down the middle of red bacteria and you can kind of see if they move out or not. These guys couldn't move and these guys could. And then you have solid, which is the traditional petri dish, full jello. It's got a lot of uh, solidifying agent in it, and it turns up into a, a, a hard, uh, not hard, but a, a, a semi, a solid um, jello-like substance that you can hold, turn, turn upside down, and manipulate. Um, and it's not going to fall out of the petri dish that it's in. So each one of these uh, types of media have their different purposes, what they're used for, and different reasons why you would select to use them. So what is auger? Um, well, auger is the most commonly used solidifying agent, the jello, if you like, in these petri dishes. Um, so auger is the solidifying agent that makes the liquids turn into a solid. Um, they use it a lot in food. You may hear it referred to as auger auger or agar agar in food. Um, you can see it here. They use it to make this kind of weird dessert with the flowers and the, the be uh, berries in it and things like that. Um, but it comes from seaweed. Um, you harvest seaweed, um, and you get this out of them, um, and you use it to solidify uh, auger. Now, they used to use jello for this, or gel gelatin, the same thing that jello is, gelatin. Um, ba ba but bacteria can eat gelatin, so eventually what would happen is they would eat their home. Um, now, this works the same way as jello. Um, you know that you dissolve sugar in jello, you dissolve water in jello, you dissolve flavoring in jello, and then you have the gelatin in there that actually makes everything solid. Auger works the same way. Auger just makes things solid. The media itself, you're going to add the water to, and then you're going to add different types of nutrients, different types of chemicals, um, different types of uh, metals and solids, and different things to encourage the growth of different species of bacteria. Um, you know this particular species likes more magnesium, or this one doesn't like sodium. This one needs more blood in its diet, more iron. So you give different types of media, you take the auger, you add those different chemicals to it, you add the water, you add the nutrients, and then you make it and turn it into a petri dish. And this is pretty much how that process works. So there's millions of different types of media out there that all contain uh, auger. So the auger is essentially just the solidifying agent. You add different types of medias, there are sugars, different types of nutrients and things like that to get different types of petri dishes, different types of medias that do different things. They allow you to grow certain bacteria that allow you to see if uh, they turn colors and things like that. But they all contain auger. Um, and that's going to be the jello that holds the petri dish together. Um, it's also found in chocolate milk. If you look it over on the back of your chocolate milk, it's called carrageenan and that's the ingredient. Um, that they hide auger in. So um, the most commonly type of used medias in microbiology lab are going to be nutrient medias, just nu plain nutrient-based medias, um, either nutrient broth or nutrient auger or triptych sugar auth, or triptych sugar auger or triptych soy broth, um, triptych soy auger TSA TSB or NB or NA nutrient broth or nutrient auger. Um, and this is just a broth that contains lots and lots and lots of sugar, uh, or sorry, and protein, sorry, lots and lots and lots of protein. I can't speak today. Lots and lots and lots of protein. Um, so you boil beef bones, you boil soy beans, all the protein comes out of it, and that's what you get. You get this nice protein-rich broth that bacteria love to eat. Now, if you just keep it regular broth, um, down here you get the liquid form. Or you can add auger to that and turn it into liquid, uh, uh, so, so, solid um, 
solid uh, beef jelly, if you like. Um, and that's what nutrient auger is. It's the solidified form of nutrient broth. So you kind of get the idea. Everybody starts out with the broth, you add the auger to it, and that makes it solid. Um, so whatever ingredients you want to add um, gets different types of augers and things like that. So nutrient broth and nutrient augers, TSA, TSB, one of the most commonly type, used types of media in microbiology. And these are also called non-specific or just generic general purpose augers. Um, everything will grow on them for the most part. It doesn't kill a certain species and allow one species to grow and kill off the others. Um, it's got enough nutrients in there that most every bacteria will grow. It doesn't have anything special about it. It's just a general, generic purpose. Most things will grow on this type of media. Um, now, when you start talking about medias, you really have to deal with how they're put together. Um, and this deals with how bacteria grow and what types of nutrients that they need. Um, now, if you know that a particular bacteria needs a high magnesium content, you need to be able to give that bacteria exactly the amount of magnesium that it needs. Um, so what you're going to need is a synthetic or a chemically defined type of media. Um, that type of media um, will have a recipe list on the back that tells you exactly what's inside of it and how much of that is in there. Magnesium, 0.6%, um, proteins, 94% derived from this and the structure of the protein. Um, it'll tell you exactly what's inside of it down to the exact chemical structural formula and the percentages of it in there. Um, and these types of medias are very useful for that type of culturing when you have a, a very picky, a very specific uh, bacteria that needs something fancy to grow um, or you're looking for a specific type of test in general with results. Um, so you want to see if a bacteria can eat a specific type of sugar. Um, you need to give them that specific type of sugar um, so you will know exactly what the chemical formula of that sugar is. Um, so that's going to be referred to as a chemically defined type of auger. Now you also have something called a complex auger. Now a complex auger um, refers to kind of our nutrient broth, kind of our nutrient auger concepts. Um, when you're looking at more general purpose things, um, and these are things like triptych soy broth. Well, soy is the soybean aspect in there, and what's the chemical formula of a soybean? I don't know, you don't know, and no one else knows because they change from every single soybean uh, crop that's grown out there depending on the water content, the fertilizer, the mineral contents of the soil. Every single soybean is different. So there is no chemical formula for a soybean. While there is a chemical formula for types of sugars, those don't change. The chemical structures are the same. Um, so you can't define what a soybean is. You can't define what beef broth is. You just can't do that. Um, so you'll have at least one ingredient on there, um, the list of ingredients that says uh, protein derived from beef or something like that, or beef extract. Um, and it's not going to tell you exactly what that is because you can't, you just don't know. Um, so that's going to be referred to as a complex form of media. Now I used this term earlier, earlier a general purpose media. Um, and this is going to be a media that's just going to grow pretty much everything out there. Um, it's got a lot of protein in it that most bacteria can eat and most bacteria are going to be really happy to grow on that and that's totally fine with them. Um, it's usually going to be a complex media like nutrient broth, nutrient auger, triptych soy auger, and things like that, that most bacteria out there can eat, and most of them are going to grow on it. And for the most part, you can use that to grow things. Well, you also have an enriched media, and this is usually going to be our, syn our uh, synthetic types of media. Um, and these are going to be uh, medias that contain special things inside of them, special growth factors. Um, now, there are some species of bacteria out there that are termed fastidious, and fastidious means picky. Um, these particular species of bacteria will grow in a lab, but not really well, unless you give them special growth factors that they like. If you're a fastidious species of a, a bacteria, unless I get this amount of concentration of blood, or this amount of concentration of serum, or this amount of concentration of salt, or whatever, I'm not going to grow happy. 
Um, so if you want these particular species of bacteria in a lab to grow happy, you have to give them a media that contains that extra stuff in it. Um, so if you were to take a fastidious streptococcus species or fastidious, um, if you were to take a streptococcus species and put it on a nutrient agar plate, it will grow. It just takes forever. They don't like to grow on that nutrient agar plate. The protein doesn't make them happy inside of it. It makes them grow really slowly. If you stick them on an enriched blood plate that contains blood, it's just a nutrient agar plate with extra blood inside of it, they grow really fast and they're really happy. Um, so you have to give them what they need. Um, and that's the difference between a general versus an enriched media. Um, and enriched medias are used by those fastidious bacteria um, to make them grow a little quicker, um, to give them the uh, needy, uh, special growth factors that those little needy guys uh, require. So chemically complex and chemically defined and complex and stuff we've already gone through. Um, you don't know what a complex media is. It's just got a soybean in it or some meat digest or something like that. Um, whereas your chemically defined contains an exact uh, nutrient requirement, an exact number. You know exactly what's in there um, and you can apply it for a specific purpose. Now the last little bit of augers um, that we need to worry about when it comes to media is selective and differential. Now this is a really big deal when it comes to media. We've got our general purpose media. And general purpose media will grow pretty much everything out there on the planet. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to tell apart gram positive or gram negative. Um, can this particular species use a particular form of nutrients or not? Um, and things like that. It just can't. Uh, everything that grows on there is going to look the same. Uh, they'll have differences of the species, just the color of the colonies and the way that the bacteria naturally look. But you can't get any other information about it. And everything's going to grow, so you don't know if they don't like salt or they, you know, too much salt to kill them because it's not really designed for that. It's just to make everything grow. So if you want to get down into the diagnosis part, if you want to get down into the let's figure out what kind of species we have, you start using different types of medias, so, namely selective and differential. Now a selective type media is used to kill a specific type of bacteria um, while allowing another species of bacteria, another form, to grow. Now generally this is going to be gram positive and gram negative. Um, gram positive, as I mentioned earlier, really don't mind living in the environment. They don't dry out really uh, uh, as much. Um, so they can tolerate a little higher concentrations of salt um, and things like that than something that's, say, gram negative that lives inside of humans that likes moist environments that are dark and uh, warm um, can. They don't like as much salt, so they will die in the presence of salt or lots of salt. So what you can do is you can take a nutrient auger plate and fill it full of salt. And what that does is if a gram positive and gram negative bacteria are struck on a general purpose plate, they'll both grow. But if you streak it on that new plate that contains lots of salt, the gram negative bacteria, which don't like the salt, will die. And the gram positive bacteria that don't mind the salt will be able to grow perfectly fine. So you got rid of half of the bacteria already, and now you can go, oh, now I've just got my gram positives. I think this is what was causing that person to be sick. I don't think it's gram negative. Let's just go ahead and get rid of the gram negatives from the get-go, and that's how you do it. Um, so selective medias are used um, when you want to get rid of the, uh, uh, you want to discourage the growth of a particular species of bacteria or a particular form um, and encourage the growth of another um, of a desired uh, microbe. So you can do this with sugars, acids, salts, and things like that. I'm um, going to encourage particular species to grow and discourage the other one. So on the other hand of that, you have differential media. And differential medias contain uh, multiple types of sugars or maybe one type of sugar um, that one bacteria can eat and another one can't. Um, so you put multiple species on there, one of them is going to eat the sugar, and when it eats that sugar, it turns purple. Um, and the other one that can't eat the sugar just stays brown. Um, so if you have bacteria that turn purple, oh, you know these are this particular species that can eat the sugar, the rest of them on there can't, and they look different. So you can see that you have two different species, and you can tell a little bit about them. Um, this one can eat this type of sugar, whereas this one can't, where if you were to just stick them again on that general purpose media, um, they just look just like normal old bacteria, and you couldn't tell anything about them.
Um, so differential media allows you to tell apart two different species of bacteria on the same plate. Um, and a selective bacteria, selective plate, um, kills one species of bacteria and allows for the uh, growth of another. Um, if you are selective, you are automatically differential because you've differentiated from one species to the other and you killed one of them from the get-go. If you're differential, that does not mean you're selective. Um, differential media is like a blood plate. Um, can grow pretty much everything you put on it, but it allows you to tell apart a couple of the different species. Um, whereas an MSA plate that's selective um, will not grow grand negative, so it is automatically differential just because it kills them from the get-go. So selective equals differential. Differential does not equal selective. Um, so here's a little example of that again. This is MSA auger, or mannitol salt auger. This is what it looks like with nothing on it. You add a species of bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. It's very commonly found on people's skins. It causes staph infections and things like that. About one in four to one in five people naturally carry it. Um, and it doesn't really cause them much of a problem. Um, if you add MSA, uh, sorry, Staphylococcus aureus to an MSA plate, it will eat the sugars found, mannitol, inside of this particular plate. It digests it, produce an, uh, produces acidic waste compounds, which turns the auger yellow. The exact same genus, Staphylococcus, different species, Epidermidus, grows on pretty much everybody's skin, cannot eat that mannitol. Um, so it doesn't produce that yellow color. It just can't do it. Um, it can grow on here, um, but it can't produce that yellow color. And you can see here, Micrococcus luteus, different species of environmental bacteria, can't grow on here at all. Um, so it's killed by the high levels of salt inside of this mannitol salt auger. So one type of auger allows us to tell apart one, two different species of bacteria, and it kills off the ones that we're not concerned about. So the staphs grow, it can allow us to tell apart the different types of staph. Um, so this is selective and differential um, because it killed things over here. Whereas this is a TSA, it's not differential, um, everything will grow. Uh, TSI slant, sorry. Um, it's not differential, everything will, or selective, everything will grow, but it is differential. Um, you can see the color differences and you can diagnose things based on their color differences, but everything will grow in these for the most part. So not selective, but differential, selective and differential. The last little bit that you need to be concerned about, I've kind of already hit on this, um, is a pure culture versus a mixed culture. Um, a pure culture plate versus a mixed culture plate and what they're useful for. Um, I'll just kind of skip forward a little bit. So a pure culture plate, you can see this one here, and this is a mixed culture plate. A pure culture plate contains one singular species of bacteria that are all genetically identical. Um, if you do test on this particular plate, you could take a sample from here, a sample from here, a sample from here, wherever you want to take it from, and they will give you the exact same results every single time you take these tests because it's the same species. They will say, yes, this is the species, yes, this is the species. They do the exact same thing every time you want to test, test them. You have to have a pure culture test for diagnostic purposes. Without it, you will not be able to get consistent or reliable results. Um, your mixed culture plate over here, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven or more different species of bacteria, um, funguses and things like that. You can identify them based on the shape and color of the colonies. They look different. Over here, you can see all of these colonies are the same shape, the same size, and about the same color. Really easy way to tell if you've got a pure culture plate or not. Over here, you can tell these are vastly different. Easy way to tell you have a mixed culture plate. If you do test on this, you're not going to get the same results for every test. It's going to be very inconsistent. Um, so this is not useful for diagnostic purposes while this one is. Um, so pure culture plates, um, you start out by taking a sample from your patient. You go through that streak for isolation concept that we went over earlier, um, and you'll get something like this. You'll get a mixed culture plate that has your spread out colonies inside of it. And this is what we're going for. This is the first step. Once you get these isolated colonies over here, you can see them down in here. This is what we're going for. Now we have the ability to scoop this guy up and scoop this guy up and test them by themselves. And when we scoop them up, we're going to start something called a subculture plate. We're going to scoop that little colony up. We're going to start a brand new plate all by itself with only that one species growing on it which allows us to have quite a few test subjects, quite a few tests that can be done without running out of bacteria that are all the same, all the same species, 
Um, and now we have a bunch to play with. So we don't just have one colony, and if you test that one colony and you mess up, you're done. Now you have quite a bit to work with. You've made a brand new pure culture plate from that mixed culture plate. Um, and now you have a bunch of bacteria that can be used to identify and diagnose your patient. So that's all I've really got for this particular slide set um, over the tools of the microbiology lab that are commonly used. Um, some of the medias and some of the ways that we get isolated colonies and some of the importance of those particular tools um, and techniques. So if you have any questions or anything you want to know about this lecture, feel free to let me know. And if not, have a great rest of your day.